Welcome back to World History by a Jew. I'm your host, Seth Fleischman, and tonight we're doing the real origin of the Philistines. We are in the middle of a series on the Bronze Age collapse, and, and I'm going to start off tonight with a story, a story all of you have heard before, but it may have been a while. So, there was a war in the land of Israel. The Israelites were fighting the Philistines. One of them was a Philistine giant from Goth named Goliath. For days, Goliath would shout to the Israelites each day and tell them to find a man that is brave enough to fight him. And he comes out for 40 straight days, find a man that is brave enough to fight me. And all, all these Israelites were terrified, even though Goliath said that the Philistines would surrender if he was bested in, in single combat. No Israelite was brave enough to face him. But then along came, comes a shepherd boy named David. He he is meeting up with the Israelite army because he has a couple brothers that are fighting in the army led by King Saul, who is fighting the Philistines. So Jesse, David's father, sent David to deliver food to his brothers in the army. As he got closer, David realized that all the Israelites were terrified of Goliath. He couldn't believe it. So in spite of his brother's pleas, David decides he will face Goliath alone. David got King Saul's support by telling him that he had faced both lion and bear to protect his father's sheep. And as we see Goliath saying, is anyone going to fight me? And David comes out to tell him, me. David walks out to the field with no armor and only a slingshot and stones as weapons. The Philistine giant looks scornfully at this young lad coming to face him. Come here and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. But David responds, you come to me armed with sword and spear, but I come against you in the name of the God of Israel. I shall strike you down so the whole earth will know the God of Israel. Goliath came at David, but David put a stone in his sling and slung it, killing the Philistine with a blow to his forehead. When the Philistines see their champion dead, they flee, only to be routed by the Israelites chasing them. King Saul now rewards David by making him an officer in the army. So this is our opener because this leads to some important questions for us tonight. First of all, was Goliath a Philistine or a Palestinian? Should we be saying Israel or should we be saying Palestine? What's the better term? Are Philistines and Palestinians the same thing? And what are the real origins of these people? Let's go exploring. So our agenda for the evening. We're still, our overall question of the series is, is the Bronze Age collapse in the Bible? I addressed this quite a bit in the last lecture. I'm not going to address it directly tonight, other than the connections to the Philistines. So first of all, I'm going to quickly go through the Bronze Age collapse and reintroduce you to the Sea Peoples. Those of you who have been in the last few lectures know it very well, but just give me a couple minutes to get everyone else the basic info they need to enjoy this lecture. Then we're going to introduce the Philistines. I'm going to look at how the, what we know about the Philistines from the Bible, and then we're going to go on a little pottery exploration, which may not sound exciting at first, but uh, trust me, I couldn't do a relief. I didn't have a good relief exploration for us to go through tonight, so I figured I would try pottery. I think it's going to work. You'll have to let me know if it works or not. Uh, and then after that, we'll move more into archaeology besides just pottery and talk about Philistine findings and archaeology. And then we're going to jump from what's in the ground all the way to the lab and look at the latest DNA research and what that can tell us. I'm going to go through the development of the names for the land of Canaan. Uh, so we'll get into this Canaan to Philistine, to Philistia, to Palestine, to Israel, Judea, so on and so forth. Then I'm going to talk about how modern Israelis and modern Palestinians are connected to this Philistine heritage. And then I'm going to answer our basic lecture questions. So you're going to see this again tonight. These are our, our questions for the night, and this will pop up a couple more times. Okay, so let's jump into our review. Summary of the Bronze Age Collapse. So circa 1300 BCE, it was a high point of civilization. If you had to pick a period of time to live in antiquity, this should be tops of your list. Uh, we have powerful empires dominating the Eastern Mediterranean. These are the Mycenaeans, who were the Greeks before the Greeks. We had the Hittites, who were covering most of modern Turkey, and then move on, and we have the, the Mitanni people in Syria, and then Egypt. Egypt was, of course, dominant, not just in modern Egypt, but also covering all of modern Israel and most of Lebanon as well. So you have these interleague trade networks. It was very sophisticated. So they were trading everything from grain uh, and clothes, necessities, to luxury items like gold and jewelry. There was 
sophisticated international diplomacy, and, I, and we have great records of this, which, which is very interesting. I talk about this in prior lectures. So uh, we're going through a technological revolution. This is the late Bronze Age, which means you're going to start the Iron Age. So there is a technological shift as well. So you have all these great things happening, and suddenly it all collapses. So why did it collapse? There was an extended period of drought, like an historic drought over decades. So areas that once had plenty of food stopped having them and people became desperate to feed their families. There was a, what's called an earthquake storm over 50 years. There were multiple significant earthquakes and also tidal waves, which destroyed cities and ports and boats. Yet a technological imbalance, it's great that technology is improving, but not when uh, the cost is to keep up is more than one can afford. Some of these countries are overly dependent on trade. So if you got your grain from Egypt and suddenly Egypt didn't have grain to send you anymore, how are you gonna feed your people? Bad leadership, the great leaders were gone. We have these bloated bureaucracies uh, from the eras of the great leaders. And then finally, the most significant point was the invasion of the sea peoples. All right, so we're gonna now do a quick review of the sea peoples. And then after that, it's all new material from here on out. Okay, so the Sea Peoples were a confederation of seafaring people. Some were land-based also, but for the, we call them Sea People. There were nine distinct people we are going to be concerned with. So uh, I don't want to torture you by saying them all with my Tennessee accent, but let's just say these first few will keep coming up. The Peleset, these are the Palestinians, Philistines, Peleset, whatever term you want to use. Luca, we'll talk about some more. Sheridan, the Sheridan or the Sheridana were the ones I talked about who, who played both sides. Uh, the Shekelesh, the, these guys, were all, and I'll give you a list in a minute, so no one needs to memorize anything. The origins of these people are somewhat disputed, although there's a decent amount that have been most likely identified, and, I, uh, and I'll talk about the Philistine origins tonight. So, the, so this lecture and the next lecture, I'll be focused on individual sea people and how they're reflected in the Bible. This one is obviously the one on the Philistines, and I will get to the, the Philistine origins uh, a little in a little bit. Now, these sea peoples wreaked havoc all over the Eastern Mediterranean, attacking the modern countries of Egypt, Israel, Lebanon, Syria, Turkey, Cyprus, Sicily, and Greece. So that's a lot of destruction. So what's the result of all this destruction? So the Mycenaean Greeks and the Hittites are gone. Their empires are gone forever. Uh, Egypt is still around. Egypt survives, but it no longer has a superpower status anymore. Many, many city-states are destroyed during this process. Uh, so Ugarit was the one we've talked about several times now. They're gone. Uh, and I, I don't need to go through the list. I will mention you should look at the list of the land of Canaan, like Ashdod and Ashkelon, Akko, Khazor, Megiddo. These all mean something to us. Now, some of those could be involved in the Israelite conquest as well. So it's not necessarily all sea people. Uh, more on that to come. So there's several sea people that settle in the land of Canaan, and the one we're looking at tonight is the Philistines. So here, here's the, the list that I promised you. Um, the ones that are highlighted in yellow or green are the ones that I'm planning to go into more details about in either, really, well, this lecture is just the, the Peleset. So the next lecture, I'll do the other four. Okay, they all, all four of these have a special connection to us in the Bible. You just don't realize it. Now, I want to show you a little bit of a relief. I said there, I wasn't doing a relief tonight, but I'm touching on this just to, to remind you that each of these sea peoples are distinctive. You can see each of these guys looks a little bit different in this picture. And here's our Sheridan, our Shardana. Notice the horned helmets, which we talked about a lot a couple lectures ago. But these are not the guys we're focusing on tonight. These are the guys we're focusing on tonight. So I want you to keep an eye out for the Philistines and they have this feathered hairdress. By the way, there were a couple other sea peoples that maybe had this feathered hairdress as well, but for our purposes, if you see this feathered hairdress in a relief, then in your mind, just think Philistine. That's what I'm asking you to remember, okay? Uh, now, with that being said, let's explore the connection between the Bronze Age collapse and the Bible, most famously with the Philistines. All right, so I'm gonna introduce you to the Philistines. The name, as I've already mentioned a couple of times, is derived from the Egyptian term Peleset, which in Hebrew is Peleshet, so that's pretty close. Uh, the Greeks would corrupt this name to, to, the, to be Philistia, so where the Peleset people settled became Philistia. I did some etymology last time, I'm going to do some more etymology this time, so I'll explain that a little bit better if you didn't see the last lecture. So the so English speakers then derived the term Palestine. Really, the, the 
the Romans took it from the Greeks and then the us English speakers took it from the, the Romans. Uh, there are numerous references to these people in the Bible. So with a lot of my lectures uh, in the Egyptian series, I would have like one sentence and have to try to figure something, you know, what this one sentence is talking about. In this case, there's no question these guys are in the Bible. There's well over 250 references. In fact, if you looked at some of their equivalent names, some people would argue it's as many as 500 references. But let's just say they're in there a whole bunch. I think that no one's going to argue with that. Um, they could, the Philistines would compete with the Israelites for control over the land of Canaan. The most famous one is the one who opened up our lecture tonight. That's Goliath. Everyone knows Goliath, who was from the city of Goth. Now, speaking of the city of Goth, there were five main cities that the Philistines settled in. So Gaza, Ashkelon, there's Goth for Goliath, uh, Ekron, and Ashdod. So these are, then there are other little settlements too, but these five cities are combined to be called the Pentapolis. And as you can see, they're all on the coast of the southern Canaan. So this would be south, the southwestern coast of modern Israel. They were a formidable enemy for the Israelites. In fact, they fought them for centuries. I mean, not constantly, but on and off for centuries, especially the first couple hundred years. And the Philistines would last almost 600 years. One little funny detail I want to mention before moving on is circumcision. Well, I guess it depends on how long ago as to how sensitive you are to the topic, but there, it seems that the Philistines were the only ones in the area not practicing it. So we think of Jews in, in Brit Milah, but it wasn't just Israelites. It was also Egyptians and Canaanites practiced circumcision as well. It seems that Philistines were so well known for being uncircumcised it was often used as a synonym for them. They're just the uncircumcised ones. So, okay, so this is your setup. And now I'm gonna start breaking it down. We're gonna look at what we know from the Bible. We're gonna look at archeology. span We're gonna look at the latest DNA. I'm gonna take it each step along the way. All right, so let's, uh, let's go first into the biblical tradition. This map you saw last lecture, it's a great map. Uh, in fact, I'm actually using it a couple times this lecture. I think it's gonna come back to the next one. I, I really like this one for, for explaining wh where we are in history. Uh, now, before there was a kingdom of Israel, before there was a kingdom of Judea, we had the era of the judges, all right? And we had numerous conflicts in that were, the biblical tradition tells us between the Philistines and the Israelites. I think the most memorable story uh, from this period is probably the story of Samson, right? Uh, I'm kind of put, I'm putting the story of Goliath into where the, the kingdom is already starting. So uh, I think in the pure judges era, you'd have to look at Samson. And I'm going to use, I'm going to talk about Samson in the next lecture because Samson is going to help us make another connection uh, next time. So I have to come back to that. We also had a big impact on the tribe of Don. I don't want to pick on one tribe, but these poor guys, they were settled right in this area of, uh, see, Joppa, so that's near Jaffa, uh, Tel Aviv, uh, if, you, if you don't know Joppa. So this area right here was supposed to be the area of uh, the tribe of Don's inheritance, as told in the book of Joshua. However, you see it's right beside Philistia, and the Philistines actually kicked the tribe of Don out of their own inheritance, and they moved up here. So uh, I know this map doesn't show it great because it doesn't show the tribal borders, but if you see the little city here, Don, uh, that's where Tel Don is today, and that's actually where the Danites went to after the Philistines kicked them out. There was open warfare between the Philistines and, uh, and Judah, and it began with the Battle of Ebenezer. I should say the Israelites were routed, and the ark was taken. It went very poorly for the Jews, and then it got worse. The Philistines went and destroyed Shiloh, and they headed north to take Megiddo and Beit Shion. So things just kept getting worse and worse, right? Okay, so let's move to the next step. To stop the Philistines, the Israelites would unite and appoint a king. Now, I want to stop for a second and, and emphasize this really. Think about it. The reason there ever had to be a king of Israel was to defeat the Philistines. That's why the Israelites demanded to have a king, was they needed someone to unite them to push the Philistines back. So uh, we know the first king was King Saul, but of course that would then lead to having King David in this entire monarchy we can in a way thank the Philistines for. Now the things would start turning around once King Saul is there. Uh, not perfect, but turning around. So in the battle, battle of Michmash, Saul's son Jonathan pushes the Philistines back. He would later become a great friend to King David. 
David then slew Goliath as we started off with this lecture, and the Philistines, as we know, fled and were routed after, after, that, after the combat between these two champions. The Philistines, though, were not done yet. They would defeat the Israelites on Mount Geboa, and King Saul and his three sons were killed. So we kind of go back down again, but then we have another high because King David becomes king, uh, and he takes Dor, he takes Jezreel Valley, then the Bashan Valley, and then David pushes Philistia all the way back into this little corner, and he establishes the United Monarchy. So great times had by all after that, right? Um, Post-David, the Philistines, and uh, it is recorded in the Bible that the Philistines and the Israelites continued, or really, I should say the Judeans, but the, is the Philistines and Judeans, the Jews, continued their relationship for good or for bad well afterwards. So in the mid 800s, we know the Philistines brought a tribute to Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, and then the Philistines, though, would go back to fight Uzziah, the king of Judah, around mid-700s BCE, and the Judeans would break down the walls of Gath, remember, that's Goliath's home, and also Ashdod as well, and then we're not done, Hezekiah, the king of Judah, would, face the, would defeat the Philistines in Gaza, uh, good thing Gaza's been peaceful ever since, right, that really solved that problem long term. The Philistines would hang around for nearly 600 years, but it would not be the Israelites that would finally push them out. We are told that it was the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. We're going to cross this with the archaeological record in a minute, uh, but I'm going to leave, uh, leave this point there for now, okay? So uh, this leads me to the most common question I get about the Philistines, and that is, where did the Philistines come from? So we're going to have to do a little bit of research to get to this. All right, so let's start with what the Bible tells us. Okay, this, the Philistine genealogy. So if you look here on the left, and I'm not, I'm not going to read all these to you, but what you can see from the bolded words, this is telling you where the Philistines came from according to the Bible. So uh, if you look at Ham, he was a son of Noah, right? And Ham had uh, Cush, Mitzrayim, Put, and Canaan. Okay, Mitzrayim, by the way, I should emphasize, is Egypt. Okay, so Ham begot Egypt. So Egypt, Mitzrayim, now is going to have a bunch of other children. And the, we have the Pathrusim and the Kesalusim, whence came forth the Philistines. So this is giving us the biblical genealogy of where these people came from, that the Philistines came from these other two groups, and they were also connected to this Kopterim. All right. Now, the, if you look a little bit further down, there's others. There's these Carathites as well. Um, and then one of my favorite lines, I put this in red. I was afraid I was going to say, I was going to forget it if I didn't, I didn't do something to make it stand out. But I just wanted to say, I think this is great, where you have this, this Negev of the Carathites. So the desert in, in Israel, uh, we now have this, this part of the desert that's considered the Negev of the, of the Carathites. So uh, here's a list of these people that are mentioned in the quotes to the left. The two that I'm really focusing on, these two, the ones that are in bold, all right, because they, they clearly identified as part of the of the police, part of the, the Philistines. Now, where are these guys from? We actually have enough tradition to know. So, Kaftor, you will see several theories as to what exactly Kaftor was, but when you cross the the Bible commentators with Akkadian with the with Egyptian, it becomes very clear. So Akkadian has Koptera, which is Crete, and the Egyptians have Keftu, which is Crete. And you can see the etymology of Koptera, it's, it's very similar. The Egyptians give us a little bit more information. They specifically named Keftu as being in the middle of the Great Green. The Great Green, I said this in one of our previous lectures, the Great Green is what the Egyptians call the Mediterranean. Uh, they also have reliefs of these people from Keftu, and they're clearly wearing Minoan and Mycenaean costumes. In other words, they're wearing Greek costumes, and they're, wear and they're holding Greek objects, like Greek cups and Greek vessels. Okay. The other one is the Herathites. Well, the Herathites actually sound more like Crete and Greek, because Crete, uh, and we've got to remember it's Kretim if you look at the Hebrew, and then Crete in Greek is Crete. And of course, we say Crete in English. That's where our word Crete comes from. So it seems that both of these people are related to the island of Crete. We get that through the Greeks. They help us back up that, that biblical aspect. And then the Akkadians and the Egyptians help us add, add up the Koptor. The difference between the two, that's probably a 
longer discussion than we need to, to get to tonight. But um, so the Bible is telling us that they do have a connection to Crete. That's what we're getting out of this. The Philistines have a connection to Crete. Now what I want to do is look at some pottery to see if the pottery can help us identify where the Philistines are from. All right. So when you look at these six bases, these are actually called a pithos. And a pithos is just a storage jar, like a huge storage jar. If you're going to trade something, if you're a merchant, you'll move it, you know, you're selling olive oil, you'll have it in one of these pithos, okay? These, there's six pithos here. They're, each pair is from a different people, okay? And they're, the distinctive difference is these necks. So you see the first one has short necks. The middle one has kind of this fluted type neck. And then you have this collar here on the last one. Okay, so let's look at where each of these are from. These have been found in Philistine lands, okay? And we know also uh, just from archeology span that the, it seems the sea peoples were using these pithos without much of a net to them. The next one is Canaanite, okay? So the uh, Canaanite has, how, has this like where the, it, the neck comes out, opens back up again afterwards. Even though you see a different shape between these two, it's the neck I want you to look at. And the last one you probably guessed by now is Israelite, all right? Now, the Israelite one, the way you can tell is this collar. And I want to get you a better view of the collar. Okay, you see how it squares off right here? If you can remember this, you will be amazed how much it helps you when you read an archaeological article. Like you'll find some, you'll read an article about some new archaeological discovery, and you'll see they always push the pottery to the side somewhere. If you look at the pottery and you see the squared off uh, collar, then it, you got a pretty good idea that it's Israelite. Uh, and that's, it's a great little helpful hint. Now, there are exceptions to this, right? These people were trading, okay? So it doesn't always work. If a Canaanite trades olive oil with an Israelite, then a Canaanite pithos is going to be in that Israelite town. In addition, it could be that someone just liked it, right? They could have shared technology. But in general, for us novices, this is a very good way of telling the difference, and we can assume it's fairly accurate. So this is, this, this is storage jars. These are merchant pottery. I want to look more like an everyday pottery to see if we can tell a difference and where it's from. So we identified that pithos as being a sea people's type item. Now I want to look at these dishes. Okay, so similar idea here. We've got different pairs. Each pair is of different origin. All right, I'm not expecting anyone to know this offhand, so, so let me tell you. The first one is Philistine. Okay, so the prettiest one, uh, this is, it's bichrome, which means it's two colors, uh, and you can see it has much more intricate designs. That's actually Philistine, and more on that in a minute. Uh, the next one of these more simplistic designs is Canaanite. All right, and by the way, for a long time, Canaanite was plain, but towards the end of the Bronze Age, I started doing very simple, single color, monochrome designs on their pottery. And then the last one, I'm sure you guessed, is Israelite. So the Israelites are the boring ones. You know, everything's plain. Uh, you can just say they're very efficient, right? They, they don't want to waste time designing things. They uh, um, also, you know, if they mix milk and meat, they got to crush, they have to demolish it. They can't reuse it. So maybe they don't want to invest as much in their dishes as someone who doesn't keep kosher. I don't know. Uh, but clearly, each of these three categories gives you a way of seeing the difference between them. And any of you now can see which it probably is. Again, doesn't always work but this is a very helpful hint to the origin of each. Now, how is this gonna help us connect where the Philistines are from? That should be your next question. And for that, I wanna look at another people's dishes, the Mycenaeans, okay? Now, when you compare, if you think of this last one I just showed you right here and the difference between them, and now let me look at the Mycenaeans again, you can see the Mycenaeans are much closer to the Philistines. In fact, if you really look at the details, right, you can see the scaling here, right here, the same scaling here. You can see how they like the triangles. You got the triangles right here. You see how they like these little arrows? You have the arrows right here. The lesson here is the Philistine pottery looks quite a bit more like Greek pottery, Mycenaean pottery. It looks much more like Greek pottery than it does anything in the land of Canaan, Israelite or Canaanite. That's what I want you to see. Now, uh, I'm going to look at one more version of this, and that's with drawings. So if you look at these drawings, I'll give you a hint. They're either Philistine or they're Greek. Anyone want to tell me which is which? 
It's a joke. I don't expect you to know because they all look identical to me. Uh, but let me show you. The first one is from the uh, it's from the Rhodesians and Island of Rhodes. Excuse me. The second one is Philistine. The third one is Philistine, and the fourth one is from Cyprus. So look at these designs. Can you tell where this designs come from? Look at look at the duck between Cyprus and here. Look at, here at Rhodes. Look at the fish, the Philistine fish to the Rhodes fish. Um, and so on and so forth. So I just want you to see you really, for, especially for us non-experts, you really can't tell them apart. So the pottery was a very early indication for archaeologists 100 years ago. Pottery was a very early indication for archaeologists that the Philistines came from the Greek world. Also, as you know, pottery is great for dating. I've talked about pottery a lot when I talk about Flinders Petrie, but I've never actually tried to go through showing the differences in pottery. So I hope you all like that for something different. So, we're going to sum this up by saying, if the pottery looks like it's from the Greek world, what does that tell us about the origin of the Philistine people? And now we need to move on to the archaeology because we're about to have another indication of their Greek origins. Okay, now I'm going to look at two different types of archaeology. One is I'm going to look at extra biblical sources, and then I'm going to look at the horror of archaeology and the dirt. Okay, so let's look at the, the extra biblical sources. And the first one here, we're going to look at a couple things about Egypt. So first of all is the Merneptah Stella. Now, I did a whole lecture on this. I'm not going to go into it in any detail other than to say in one sentence, we know, thanks to Merneptah, that as of 1210 BCE or so, there were Canaanites, not Philistines, in Ashkelon because he fought them. If you want to know more, just go see the video. Uh, I spent an hour talking about it. Now, next is this pottery we just went through. How do we bring that back into the archaeology? Well, in, in two lectures ago, we talked about Medinet Habu, the reliefs there, when Ramses III uh, defeated the Sea Peoples, and he tells us he settled them along the coast of Canaan. We can see from the pottery that the pottery, this Philistine pottery started appearing around 1175 BCE. We know that Ramses had his great victory. Yeah, 1177 BCE is the common date. Maybe in 75, maybe in 80, but basically 1177 BCE. And this pottery perfectly fits with what Ramses III is telling us that the Philistines were now starting to settle in Ashkelon. I also want to look at Assyrian and Babylonian records. These are the great conquerors. And I have a map here as I'm talking. If you want to look at this map, this is showing the, the different campaigns from both the Assyrians and the Babylonians. But we know from 730s BCE that the Assyrians conquered Philistia. All right. And then, thanks to the Treaty of Esarhaddon, which was actually a treaty between the Assyrians and the city of Tyre, which is right here in modern Lebanon. Um, but in this treaty, it talks about the Philistines. So we know that they were still there, even though they had been defeated 60 years earlier, they were still in Philistia. The Babylonian Chronicle, though, that's really where it ends. So I told you the Philistines lasted almost 600 years. So I'm saying that's for about 1177 BCE up to 604 BCE. That's when the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar destroys Ashkelon. He destroys Ashdod, destroys Ekron, and he is actually going to exile these people back to Babylonia. And we know they were in Babylonia because 12 years or so later, there's cuneiform ration lists listing Philistines working for Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. So their officials did make it back to Babylon, but unlike the Jews who would come back from exile, the Philistines never did. Okay, after, after the Babylonians defeat them and, and disperse them, they never... Uh, come back together as a people. Again, Philistia is done as of 604 BCE, and it's done for good. Now, I want to mention a few other archaeological finds. So I just want to show, I talked about the pottery, but I want to mention a few other differences that are relevant to our discussion. I'm not going to talk about the pottery anymore. Uh, I just don't want to forget that it was here, but also burial customs, okay? Uh, so by the way, when I say the Aegean, the, the Mycenaeans, the Greeks, I'm really all talking about the same thing. I'm talking about that area of the Mediterranean uh, around modern Greece and the islands surrounding it, okay, uh, down to, to Crete, so forth. Uh, anyway, so the, the burial customs were very, of the Philistines were very similar to that of the uh, Mycenaeans and those of the Greek world, okay? So one is they have these metal mouth lords. Like they put these metal mouth guards over their mouths when they, they died. 
Uh, I'm sure it's, you know, to keep out evil spirits or something, something along those lines. It doesn't matter, but it's a very distinctive practice. And the Philistine burials continue that practice, something that you really only see in the Greek world, okay? Also, they have these burial figurines, and I'll put in an example of one here, right? So these burial figurines were, were buried with the bodies. And again, this, this, this type of item, specifically this look, was very unique to the Greek world. And then one other big difference is, and this one is, would probably be anyone's guess, is you see much, a lot more pork bones, a lot more pig is being eaten in Philistine towns than in uh, proposed Israelite towns. It's not 100%, right? And you can have one of the other culture in a given town, that can happen. But basically, if you look in the urban areas, you're gonna see a huge difference in the consumption of pork between the Philistines and, and the Jews. And, and, and to this, you know, that would continue to this day, right? To see the same thing even this day. And again, there's exceptions. But, uh, you know, it, when, it, when it comes to pork, it's like the only thing Jews and Muslims agree on. So there's probably something to it. Uh, and it was back then too. And then I want to talk about advanced metallurgy. So uh, Philistine iron versus Israelite bronze. So the Philistines really came with this new iron technology. They were kind of the harbingers of this Iron Age. Now, let me just say the Hittites had it too. The Hittites had been there before. I'm not saying that the Philistines invented it, uh, but they were, they were probably the first ones in the land of Canaan that really brought this iron technology in mass. And the question is, do they have a technological advantage? Do they, know how, they, they have a know-how the Israelites couldn't replicate? Or do they somehow manage to have a political uh, uh, monopoly? And when you read the Bible, uh, it does talk about the Philistines controlling iron, particularly when they were ruling most of what is now Israel. But you could argue either way, whether it's technological or political. I just want to say, though, that also this iron tech matches what we know of the sea people, right? We know the sea people are bringing this new technology. They're defeating, as we talked about in the prior lectures, they're defeating these chariots now. They have new weapons, new weapon techniques and they're, they're beating armies they wouldn't have been able to beat before. And it's not just these odds here, odds and ends of iron. They're bringing knives, plowshares, spearheads, battle axes, so a lot of technology, okay? So this is enough of what we can learn in the ground. Now I wanna switch over and look at what science can tell us. What can we learn from DNA? Now, I always like to point out in these lectures when new stuff is happening. There's always new developments in archeology span and one that makes a huge difference in biblical archeology span just happened in 2016. Forever, archeologists have been looking for a Philistine cemetery. There's so much information you can get from a cemetery and they finally found the Philistine cemetery of Ashkelon in 2016. So this opened up a whole new avenue of exploration regarding the Philistine people. And there's, there's a couple DNA studies, very recent. One just released its findings last year in 2019, and the other one just released their findings in 2020, this year. And I wanna go through these with you and how they help us with our discussion, okay? So DNA study number one, report, as reported in 2019, there were three time periods in Ashkelon that were studied with the DNA of the burials were studied, okay? So we had burials from 1650 to 1200 BCE. We all agree that's before the Sea Peoples. Um, the next area of study was 1150 to 1100 BC, which was just after the Sea Peoples arrived. And the last one was more like 950 to 800 BC, which was long after the Sea Peoples, you know, a couple hundred years after the Sea Peoples had arrived. These years obviously aren't exact, but I'm just trying to make it arranged for sim simplicity's sake. Okay, so let's look at the findings. So group number one, so this is the first one. The the people of Ashkelon were not distinguishable from other area Canaanites. In other words, their DNA was basically the same as all the other Canaanites in the land of Canaan. Uh, and this would also back up what Merneptah told us, right? Merneptah told us he faced Canaanites in Ashkelon based on the, the way they were portrayed in his reliefs. And we see this here. Now I wanna look at group two. So group two was right after the Sea Peoples arrived. We had, there was four infant burials of note that are very important. These four infants all had DNA 25 to 70% non-Canaanite DNA that specifically was from Greece, Crete, and Sardinia. So right in the, the Mediterranean world, right around Greece, right in this Greek world, this Mycenaean world we've been talking about. Uh, and then what's interesting is when you look at group, oh, and I should also mention the emphasis is important due to the fact that 
they had to have been born there, right? If you have adults, they could have always moved there. You don't know. But in order for an infant, you know, you don't travel across the ocean with an infant uh, or a pregnant woman either. That's very dangerous for her health. So most likely the assumption is an infant uh, born in the land of Canaan was uh, most likely conceived or at least knowingly conceived and certainly born where in that place. So it's important to show that this, this Greek DNA is there. Group number three goes back to the Canaanites. In other words, we have this influx of Greek DNA in group two in this time period, and a couple hundred years later, boom, back to Canaanite. So it's like from goes from three back to one and skips number two. They kind of disappeared on us. More on that later. DNA study number two, which was just from this year. Uh, in fact, when they released the study, it was my article of the week and my email that week. So we had 73 people in the land of Canaan uh, that were, that, and they spanned over a 1500 year period. So we had these 73 burials. And by the way, if you look at this map on the right, I just want to show you, these are where these ancient, where they're pulling these ancient burial remains from for testing, if, if, uh, if you're interested to know. Uh, four of the sites for this particular test were in modern Israel and one was in modern Jordan, okay? Uh, so what's interesting about these 73 people is they were all genetically similar. Like they were not completely different at all. Uh, they clearly had DNA links between them. This includes modern Israeli Jews and modern Palestinian Arabs. Both showed over half their DNA matched with the ancient Canaanites from here. Okay, that's a really important point. The other half of these Israelis and Palestinians varied. Okay, so you had half that were Canaanite, but the Palestinians then diverged really to what you'd assume, right? Muslim conquest, Arabia, East Africa, whereas the Jews had an influx from whether they were Ashkenazi or Sephardi and wherever their, their families may have been at the time. Now, I wanna look at one more study. This just kind of adds to our story. It's not one of the prime studies, but this is also recent, only three years ago, and they, did testing of five Canaanite burials in Sidon. Uh, Sidon here, yes it is, right here. Sidon, which is, in modern, which is in modern Lebanon. So they tested these five Canaanite burials from ancient Sidon with modern Lebanese. Modern Lebanese do have a reputation for being in this area for a long, long time without moving. And what do you know? Modern Lebanese had a 90% DNA correlation with these ancient Canaanites in Sidon. So impressive stuff. So what do we learn from these DNA studies? Let's look at the Philistines. The evidence, remember those three different time periods, the middle time period had Greek DNA. So the evidence supports the 1175 BCE settlement that we've been working at. The infants, as I mentioned, that were born at the site had to basically had to have been born locally, uh, but they had Greek DNA, which is important. But why did they disappear after two year, 200 years? Well, they went native. Okay, that's kind of that's a normal phrase to say that they mixed with the local population. This tells us something important because this tells us these Philistines, this entire Philistine kingdom, the entire Philistine people the Israelites were facing for 600 years, the Philistines were actually a minority. The Peleset were a minority of the kingdom from which their name was derived. Okay, now looking at this minority, the non-Canaanite DNA, in other words, the Greek DNA, indicates multiple locations of European origins. So these people that did settle in Philistia had Crete, Greece, and Sardinia, D, Sardinian DNA in them. However, you got to give the Philistines credit. They seem to have always been a minority, uh, never a majority of their own people, but they brought with them the sophisticated Greek culture that stuck. So even though their DNA would disappear after less than 200 years, this Philistine culture, this, this kind of merged Greek culture would last 600 years, 400 years after the DNA had disappeared. So, uh, but it is interesting. To, so you gotta give the culture credit, but it is very interesting to note that the Philistines were minority in their so-called Philistia. Now the Lebanese doesn't help us as much, but just to prove a point, and that is that the Lebanese are a great test case. They prove it's possible to retain a high correlation of DNA if the people stayed in the same place and married amongst themselves, which the Lebanese did. Okay, now I want to look at what this does for modern Jews. Modern Jews in this, in this study has got about half their DNA from ancient Canaanites. All right, this shows us that we have an ancient connection to the land. Some people aren't going to like that it's half Canaanite. 
they, they, they were like, there's no way it's Canaanite. We're not Canaanites. But let's face it, Jews were a mixed multitude that left Egypt. They came to the land of Canaan. And how many times do we read about proselytes, about respecting proselytes, about treating proselytes uh, properly in the Bible? It's telling us there probably were a lot of proselytes around. That's why they talked about them so much. I should also mention a third possibility, and that is it is possible there are people from Canaan that have only been found in Canaan, and therefore they're labeled Canaanite. Perhaps they, in their own times, would have been labeled something else. What I really want to get to, though, what the whole point of this is, is not whether you're bothered by Canaanite or not. It's that Jews, for the most part, left this land nearly 2,000 years ago. They come back, you know, 1,800 years after they left, and they still have half their DNA from this land. Half their DNA is tied to this land, and it's equal to the people that never left. All right, that's big. It's equal to the people who never left, even though Jews have been gone for nearly 2,000 years. All right, now I want to look at how this affects modern Palestinians, modern Palestinian Arabs. Uh, I'm going to get into that in just a minute. So Palestinians give out half their DNA from ancient, ancient Canaanites as well. The other half were likely impacted by the Muslim conquest, which is probably the most obvious. That moved a lot of people and changed a lot of marriages. Uh, so, and then these, where did these other halves come from? As I mentioned before, Arabia, uh, the near, other places in the Near East, and East Africa. And I don't think that should bother anyone. It makes logical sense. What's important to note here is there's no distinguishable South Europe DNA. South Europe is Greece. There's no Greek DNA in these people. Even if they were descended from the Philistines, I'm not saying they are. I'm just saying that the Philistines, their DNA was gone after 200 years. So you're talking, you know, another 2,700, 2,800 years down the road. That DNA is certainly not going to be in anyone today. So there's no Philistine DNA. It's not in modern Palestinians. And it wasn't even the modern Philistines once their kingdom was gone. Um, so now let's go back to our lecture questions. Was Goliath a Philistine or a Palestinian? You're starting to know these answers, right? Should we say Israel or Palestine? Are Philistines and Palestinians the same? Now let's take a closer look at the modern land and people. Now, I went through a pretty detailed etymology discussion in my last lecture uh, uh, between Palestine and Philistine. I don't want to do that this time, except to say, if you want to know more, go to that one. However, I do want to point out one addition, and that is this Philistine. I think it's important when you look at the term Philistine for someone who speaks Arabic, that Philistine and Palestine would sound the same. Why? There's no P sound in Arabic. So that could cause some confusion, even well-meaning confusion, because in English, we say Palestine when we mean the new, and we say Philistine when we mean the old, um, and Arabic does not have that mechanism for differentiation. The, in fact, if you're wondering, if somebody who speaks Arabic usually pronounces the P sound as a B, so instead of the word push, it would be the word bush. And there was this joke I heard a long time ago uh, it's going to date itself. But so when Mubarak was the dictator of Egypt, Mubarak comes and visits President Bush, and I'm dating it, and he uh, has this great tour of the United States with President Bush. After that, he flies back to Cairo, he lands in Cairo, and he, and he calls all his head staff into the room and say how much better the American president is treated than he is, even though he's the absolute ruler of Egypt. And they say, well, how come? Uh, Mubarak, and he said, because President Bush has his name on the back of every door in the United States. Um, so I, I, don't, I can't tell if you're laughing or not, but that was kind of funny and it popped in my head again. So let's look at Palestine, the land, instead of Palestine, the people. Okay, so biblically speaking, as we've well established, we have the land of the Philistines with the Pentapolis. Okay, and the Greeks then gave us this term Philistia. And now I want to go back to our culture, to this this idea of cultural bias, right? If the Greek people know that Philistia was founded by fellow Greeks, they're much more likely to call it Philistia than they are to call it Israel or Judea. They're going to use the term for their own people. So there could very well be some cultural bias. For the Romans, though, when the Romans conquered Israel or Judea, I should say Judea, when the Romans conquered Judea, they named it Syria-Palestina or just Palestina, okay? 
This was in 135 of the Common Era. The Roman Emperor Hadrian, under his leadership, they defeat the Bar Kokhba Revolt, which is a horrible tragedy in, in Jewish history. Um, but after Bar Kokhba's revolt, that's the end of the independent kingdom of Judea. That's the end of the Jews having their own kingdom or a country up until 1948. Well, Rome intentionally chose to honor the Jews' enemies. So Rome took the Greek name intentionally and named it Palestine to, to honor the Jews' rival and to erase Jewish identity. At the same time, the Romans renamed Jerusalem as well to Alia Capitolina, which was to honor both the Emperor Hadrian and the Greek god Zeus. So they really were trying to erase the Jewish memory. I'm happy to report the Romans are long gone, but it's now the Jews' land again. Um, but nonetheless, uh, the name the Romans gave the land stuck. So the Romans called it Palestine. Then the Byzantium came in, uh, and Byzantium, of course, we think of as the Eastern Roman Empire. They continue calling it Palestine. The Muslims came in after the Muslim conquest. They kept the name Palestine. Of course, they pronounced it with an F, but same idea. The Ottomans, same name, Palestine. And at the, as, after, as World War I was coming to an end, the British get control of this territory, and the British named it after the Roman term, the Mandate of Palestine was the British term, which makes perfect sense because for 1,800 years, it had been Palestine now. So what I, but what I want to point out is from the Romans – in 135 CE to the end of the British mandate in 1948 CE, so your 1800 years, the term Palestinian was used for all residents of this area. Jew, Muslim, and Christian, if you lived here, you were a Palestinian. So what's my point? I get a lot of complaints when, when I say Palestine. People get naturally get offended or they're sensitive to it. Palestine is a legitimate term for the region as a historical name. Um, same, same way of saying Byzantium. Byzantium was never the name the Romans used for the Eastern Roman Empire, but it's okay to call it Byzantium from a historical point of view. Same thing for Palestine. It's just gotten politicized. All right, it was a legitimate term for the region for 1800 years. It was used by the Greeks, Romans, Byzantines, Ottomans, and yes, Jews. So let's talk about these crazy Jews calling themselves Palestinians. I want to point out a few... Uh, Jewish organizations to you and what they and how their names developed. The Jerusalem Post was founded by Jews in 1932 as the Palestinian Post. It changed its name in 1950 to the Jerusalem Post. And here's the, the, the newspaper from the day Israel was born, modern Israel was born. The Israel Philharmonic Orchestra was founded by Jews in 1938 as the Palestine Symphony Orchestra. It changed its name in 1948. Here's a ticket from a concert of the Palestine Orchestra dated 1936. The United Jewish Appeal, a, this, for those who don't know, that's an international body for raising money for Jewish causes. So the, in, the Israeli arm of it was founded as the United Palestine Appeal in 1925 and changed its name to the United Jewish Appeal in 1939 when it was rolled up into some other groups. In World War II, the Palestine Regiment of the British Army, right? So Palestinians, Jews and Arabs fought for the British during World War II. The regiment from this area was called the Palestine Regiment, and it was a majority Jewish regiment, 1,600 Jews and 1,200 Arabs when it was founded. Should also mention that after the creation of the British Mandate Zionists, Jews were trying to get other Jews to visit the region, put posters all over the world saying, visit Palestine, okay? So clearly Jews used the term Palestine for themselves. Now I wanna look at this a little bit more. When does the modern Israeli identity begin? When do they stop being Palestinians, stop being Palestinian Jews and become Israelis? This is almost certainly between the years 1948 and 1950. And I look at it from two events. First, we have the War of Independence in 1948 when Israel actually becomes a country. And then two years later in 1950 when the Palestinian Post becomes a Jerusalem Post. These two key events in my mind is the transition from Palestinian Jew to Israeli, all right? And now I'm going to get, do a little bit of an editorial. I actually think it's completely ridiculous that Jews ever use the name Palestinian. Because if you look at it from a biblical point of view, I mean, could you imagine King David, King Saul, Samson? These guys would be rolling in their graves that Jews were called Palestinians. I, I didn't want to say Nazis. That would be an exaggeration. But 
I think for us, for those who know a little bit of Russian history, imagine 500 years from now, Jews calling themselves Cossacks. I mean, it sounds utterly ridiculous, but this is basically the equivalent of a Jew calling themselves a Palestinian that, you know, for hundreds of 600 years, we fought these people and then we're going to take our name from them. A little bit ridiculous. I mean, that's going to help us with our last point here. So my basic idea is let the Palestinians have the name. We don't want it. We should have never taken it. It's ridiculous we ever had it. All right. Now I want to flip this around a little bit. And I'm going to look at this as a more of like a, not from a Palestinian point of view, but at least more what they would, what their worldview would be on that. Okay. Palestinians, and I mean modern Palestinian Arabs, do claim ancient descent. Okay. But what Jews are most sensitive to is when Palestinians call themselves Philistines. Well, I can tell you that that's not very common for Palestinians to say they're Philistines. They have done it. Arafat did say it, but it's really a relatively recent claim uh, that, the, the, you know, it's not like for 100 years they've been saying they were, they were descended from Philistines, okay? The most consistent claims have been the next two. So that's Jebusites. And that's actually the most consistent claim. If you want to go look at Arafat quotes or Palestinian leadership quotes, they seem to say Jebusites more than anything else. Uh, Jebusites is, it's a little bit disputed exactly who the Jebusites were, but the uh, Cliff Notes version of it was they were Canaanites residing around Jerusalem before the Israelite conquest. The Jews were not successful in pushing them all out. So we know Jebusites, at least according to the biblical tradition, Jebusites remain there afterwards. Okay, so... The trick is there's no archaeological evidence of the Jebusites. There's no proof these people were ever there. Uh, so there's no way to connect them or disconnect them from the, from the modern Palestinians. There's no proof. The other being want to look at is the Canaanites. Now, Canaanites, we've heard less, really, but they have used it consistently throughout the years. I mean, the Palestinians have used it consistently. Thanks to DNA, I think this claim is only going to increase because the DNA studies do back up the claim that uh, Palestinians are descended from uh, ancient Canaanites. But what I want to say is for the average Palestinian, other than the political aspect, I don't think they would care because the Quran doesn't have Jebusites, it doesn't have Canaanites, it doesn't have Philistines. They wouldn't know who any of these people are if it wasn't for their, what their leadership said. Okay. Now these next quotes can be highly inflammatory. Uh, so I want to be careful with them. What I want to establish is that the Palestinians were not a people an identifiable people until later. In other words, in the, look at what was said in the 1930s. Here you have a Syrian Arab leader saying Palestine is a term invented by the Zionists. That's right. The Romans gave us the term when they kicked us out of our land, but somehow it's our term that we invented. And he then goes on to say that Palestine is alien to the Arabs. All right, that's the 1930s, it's a long time ago now. But if you go on here and look at this conversation between Assad and Arafat in 1976, or if you look here from this PLO Executive Committee statement in 1977, they, the Palestinian people does not exist. It's really for political purposes that there's a Palestinian people. Okay, um, I don't want to get any more than that, but what I want to say is these people do at this point claim to be Palestinian people. What does that mean for us today? All right, so when did the modern Palestinian identity begin? So Palestinian Arabs became Palestinians somewhere between 1964 and 1968. That's when they gave up on this whole, we're Syrians or we're Jordanians or what have you, and we're Palestinians. So the big event that happened was in 1967 when you had the Six Day War and Israel miraculously defeats the combined armies of Egypt, Syria, and Jordan and defeats them in six days. This was the sign to the Palestinian leadership that they were not going to win, at least not gonna win anytime soon against the Israeli army. So they started shifting to more political goals. Uh, unfortunately, part of that to them, political goals includes terrorism. The, the days of them depending on an army kicking the Jews out kind of ended in 1967. The Palestinian National Charter is the Palestinian Liberation Organizations. That's the governing body of the Palestinians. That is their charter, which was first uh, put out in 1964 and then again in 1968. What happened between those two things? The Six Day War. In 1964, uh, Jews were considered Palestinians if they lived in the land of Palestine. It said it very specifically. And the Palestinians referred to as Palestinian Arabs. That all changed in 1968. 1968, the charter was rewritten and this time specifically called Palestinian Arabs as the Palestinian people. So this shows a real peoplehood happening in the end of the 1960s. 
So what does this mean? So Palestinian Jews became Israelis around 48 or 50, and the Palestinian Arabs became Palestinians around 1964 to 1968, okay? So I should say the Palestinians originally took this name not because of the Philistines. They were not claiming the name because of the Philistines. They were claiming the name because they were native residents of the British Mandate Palestine. And that's, that by, at that point in the beginning, this applied to both Jews and Arabs under the British and initially under the Palestinian Arabs themselves. And uh, I know I, I keep saying this thing about the ridiculous thing, but it really does bother me. So I keep saying it over and over again, hoping it'll stop bothering me. Now, what do I think about the Palestinian Arabs becoming the Palestinians? And I may differ with some of you on, on my thoughts. Basically, I believe people have a right to self-identify as they wish. So assuming whatever they're self-identifying as doesn't infringe the right on the right of others, I don't see a problem. So, and also, just because the Palestinians did not claim peoplehood until 20 years after the Jews, that does not mean it's somehow not allowed, okay? Because the, the basic thing is no one else was claiming the name. The Philistines are long dead, and the Palestinians want it, okay? So to summarize, we know now many Palestinian families have ancient roots in Canaan, but they are not the biblical Philistines. They're not from the Bible, uh, but the, you know, the biblical Philistines were forced from their land 2,700 years ago. They're long gone. So that emphasizes the point, no one else alive has a right to claim the name. So let them be Palestinian if they wish. My problem, what really bothers me is, the problem lies in weaponizing Palestinian to delegitimize Israel. Okay, let's wrap up, that's a tough one. Our lecture goals for tonight was Goliath, the Philistine or a Palestinian? We all know very well he's a Philistine now. Should we say Israel or Palestine? It is the modern country of Israel that's undeniable, but from a uh, scholarly point of view, from a historical point of view, it's not necessarily wrong to say Palestine. Are, Pal are Philistines and Palestines, the Palestinians the same? Absolutely not. For the most part of their history, Palestinians wouldn't have claimed to be. It's only a more recent time that they have uh, at all. So what are their real origins? So the origins of the Palestinians are, it was defined by the Palestinian Liberation Organization. You can look up the charter, but it defines Palestinians as pre-1948 natives to the British Mandate Palestine. It's nothing to do with the Philistines. That's where they, they're Palis Palestinians because of the Mandate Palestine. The evidence does support significant descent from Canaanite natives, right, from the DNA. But there was a genetic infusion of the, from the Muslim conquest. We had Arabia, we had Egypt, we had Africa. Okay, things did change, but they, have, they seem to have some sort of connection. Until 50 years ago, they, the Palestinians saw themselves as Syrians or Jordanians. It was only really since 1968 they coalesced into a people called the Palestinians. Now I want to look at the origin of the Philistines. So the evidence supports an 1175 BC settlement that fits great with our entire chronology for the last, I don't know, five, six lectures all of it fits together. Uh, and this lecture, just another piece in the puzzle. We see that the, the Philistines had a genetic infusion from the Greek world, but let me say it was multiple places in the Greek world from what's now modern Greece, from Crete, from Sardinia. The Philistines were not one, uh, just one sea peoples. So they may have included the Peliset, but this tells us they were not just the Peliset. This is an important point I'm gonna come back to. They quickly, diffused into their, they quickly diffused their Greek DNA into the Canaanites and disappeared, at least DNA-wise, even though they had a Swiss-state culture that lasted for 600 years. Now, I want to come back to this point. This is my ending point. Okay, so Dr. Mayer is one of the most distinguished uh, archaeologists in Israel, and I wanted to use this quote regarding various sea peoples instead of just the Peliset. While I fully agree that there was a significant foreign component among the Philistines in the early Iron Age, these foreign components were not of one origin, and no less important, they mixed with the local Levantine populations from the early Iron Age on. What is he saying? He's saying we have multiple people there. It's not just the Peliset, and you have multiple Canaanites. So what does this all mean? There are other Philistines. So next time we'll come back, we're going to meet the other Philistines. We have biblical enemies that have surprising origins. We have the impact of the Philistines on the Israelite conquest. We have an Israelite tribe who may very well have been partially sea peoples. And then we have other biblical topics like the mystery of Amalek. So I hope you will come back in a couple of weeks and we will continue this conversation and try to solve a few biblical mysteries. 
Uh, with that, I'd like to open the floor for questions.